borders. Okay. I think we also have now uh, everyone else is in here, I think, right? Yeah, I think everyone's attending. <laughs> Got, we have uh, Nina in here and Tiare and. Oh, there she is. Hi, Nina. Hello, Nina. How are you? Hey, Danielle. Hi. It was great to hear you. Still, that was. I think it's interesting, just like just a little follow up to what you were talking about, Stellark is, um, I mean, science is very intuitive also, um, right? I mean, I've talked with lots of scientists and most of them admit like their ideas, it's not unlike us, it'll sort of come out of a deep consideration of a particular question and experience around that area. And then they kind of, it comes to them in bits and pieces and jags, and then they try to create an, ex an experiment that will allow them to verify and, and reproduce that. But, but the process comes yeah, through yeah, a body. No. Yeah, no, of, of course, one can say scientists, uh, you know, are creative, but of course, creative in very different ways. And, and yes, it's intuition sometimes counts, um, but that's not, as, as you alluded, um, scientific practice, you know, um, uh, generates information that needs to be verified. That it's it's a it's a process that um, is much more methodical and much more, um, uh, in a sense, utilitarian in 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 pursuing knowledge. You know, uh, specific knowledge about the world. I don't necessarily think art art does that or needs mm -hmm. to be authenticated by any kind of institutional or scientific pursuits. Uh, certainly, you know, areas like bio art uh, are possibly best positioned to critically um, interrogate the relationship between uh, science and art, but um, yeah. Anyway, it's an area that, that will completely consume us, and it shouldn't. <laughs> yes, no, you're right. <laughs> it's it's another discussion, and it's a much uh, longer one. And you know, being complicit uh, with a university for the last five years, uh, being in a position of doing full time research. <laughs> Um, you know, I've had to kind of uh, try to manage, um, you know, the dilemmas of of, um, of, of sort of uh, you know writing research statements and and methodologies and uh, reporting outcomes as if you have to articulate as if you know. Uh, text becomes a kind of a, a prosthesis for any artistic outcome. You know, you have to mm -hmm. sort of talk about it to justify it, to to to, to ratify it, um, and all you're really doing is is ticking boxes for university admin. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> enough. <laughs> Enough. Okay, I'm just giving you guys a five-minute warning. Um, I'm, I, so just so you know, on my screen, I have Delma um, communicating with me because she's operating everyone in um, all the translators. Uh, and then any questions that come through the live stream, she will also connect with me about, and then I'll relay those to you all. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of the structure because we're going to start live on both. It will sim This platform simultaneously streams on Facebook and YouTube, um, but I'm not watching either of those, so they will, they're, um, they will let me know. Delma and, and the other team will let me know when any questions come through. Um, I want to make sure everybody knows each other in the room before we start. Um, I think that we, Stellark and Nina, you've been discussing with each other, um, but we also have Tiare uh, Ribiera, who's Ribio. Sorry, how, how do I pronounce your last name? Ribo. Hello, Hello, everyone. Sorry, ah, Hello. And then Anna Dimitrio, and, and let me know if I don't, Hi. if I'm not pronouncing your last name pro, uh, okay. properly. 
Okay, Dimitri. great. That's right. Yeah. Dimitri. <laughs> okay, Dimitri. Okay, uh, with Nina Wiseman, Estelle Arc, Tiara, and, and so just to let you know, because this is simultaneously translated, this is a quite an ambitious <laughs> endeavor, endeavor, but it's it just just make sure to don't speak very fast. Just sort of speak um, <laughs> at a pace where the translators can can hear you and translate with you, which is also a problem for me because I tend to speak quickly. So I, I will, you know, I'm going to be a little bit slower in my in my speech because we just have to make sure we're translating. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then I'm going to walk us through everything at the beginning. And then the order of um, presentations will be Stellar, Anna, Nina, and Tiare. Um, and then I know those are all formed very differently. And I'm sure you've done all practices with Delma. And so I think they're operating all the visuals on their end, uh, from what I understand. Um, and Delma, can you just verify we've got, um, the, you know, um, Stellark is, is yeah, 15 minutes of discussion and five minutes of Q&A, or is it 20 minutes of discussion? Is it 15, five, or? 15 minutes I... and discussion. OK, and then with, and, um, and with discussion. OK, and then, and then with um, everyone else, is it 10 minutes in discussion? OK, great. So that's oh, how that exactly. works. OK. And then um, we'll. I know we had some seed questions to start with, uh, but we'll we'll also um, I may add, add some impromptu questions because I actually think there's some interesting weaving between all of your different works and progr projects. Okay. And, and right. I have to apologize in advance that um, I'm going to have to leave you soon after I do the presentation because it's very late here and. I've got other stuff to do in, in the morning, so please excuse me for not staying for the whole the whole time. Yeah, thank you, because <laughs> I realize it's like one o'clock in the morning for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, great okay, to meet so you, and um, excited to hear your talk, Stellark, and honored to be on a panel with everyone in this room. Um, I also have to apologize, they're doing jackhammering outside, so let me know if it gets too loud and you can hear it. Um, but they, I t they said they'd stop at um, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, so I think it shouldn't be happening. But if it does, let me know. I'll mute my mic anyway. Yeah. Okay, great. There. And let me make sure this is... Okay, so we're about to start, and I'm going to try to also... Um, share this um, on our all streaming notice. is running. Um, okay. First okay, so let's get video, started. Is the video and then you can introduce the session, Daniela. Okay, great. I I'll indicate by the chat. Thank you.
All right. Good. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone, um, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Danielle Sambieta, the Managing Director for Leonardo ISAS. I'm welcoming you to the uh, the third event in the celebration online for Leonardo's 50th anniversary. This event has been simultaneously broadcast on radio, television, and social media on both Facebook and YouTube. This is the third in the series of live events. Um, please also mark your calendars for the final 50th anniversary series taking place uh, November 19 through 23 in Uruguay. There will also be a moment during the in-person celebration to connect online. So we will do another uh, live event during that, uh, that in-person oh, wow. conference. Uh, so to acknowledge all the fantastic people who have supported this uh, initiative, this event is organized by Ania Cultural in Uruguay and supported by the National Network of Mexico, CUDI, and the Academic National Uruguay, RAU, and we count on the collaboration of the Clara Network in Latin America. So um, just as... Um, I mentioned this is, if you're not familiar with Leonardo, the International Society for Art Sciences and Technology. We are a um, international organization. Uh, we focus on supporting, next slide please. Uh, we support artworks on the intersection of art, science and technology uh, through uh, pro programs and through publications. And uh, if you want more information, you're welcome to check out leonardo.info to give you a little bit of understanding about our 50th anniversary events and our organization. So what I'd like to share with you next is within the next hour and a half, we are gonna hear from a lot of artists working on critical issues around the topic of beyond border. Uh, this is crossing the art and science with body, bacteria, the exploration of the most micro level uh, to the most terrestrial one. This event, again, we mentioned is simultaneously broadcasted. And so what we'll do is we're going to hear from all the different uh, artists and then we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A and a lot more time towards the end. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, this is Beyond Borders. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna briefly just give you a, a, a very brief overview of the artists who are speaking today. I encourage you all to look at their, their websites for more in depth about their projects and bios, um, but they're gonna, they're gonna tell you quite a bit about their work. Uh, so uh, the first artist we're gonna hear for, from today is Stellark. Stellark is a performance artist who has visually probed and acoustically amplified his body. Next slide. Okay, the next is Anna uh, Dimitrio. Anna Dimitrio is a British artist who works with sculpture, installation, craft, and biological media to explore our relationship to infectious disease, synthetic biology, and robotics. Next slide. Then we're gonna hear from uh, Tiara Ribio, a Hawaiian-American new media artist whose work explores entanglement of human technologies, infrastructures, mythologies, and the environment of non-human species. And then we're gonna hear from Nina Wiseman, who is a former dancer turned installation artist, fascinated by the critical roles that movement and sensation play in forming for, uh, thought. So, um, each artist is going to share a little bit about their work. Feel free to comment on the live stream. There'll be somebody monitoring these. Uh, towards the end, we'll have open questions for everyone. If there's time, we could take one or two questions after each artist. Um, we, we had a, a couple questions. I'll just briefly show you what those are. But um, I think we should get started into uh, 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 to, to Stellark's presentation. Okay, <laughs> great. So, um, so I re thank you, Selleck, for joining us. And I think the next we want to we want to then now introduce um, st the videos that Stellark has has put together. Why don't we start, Stellark, with you just giving a little bit of um, background about yourself and uh, a little bit about the journey um, of of your work over the past um, 
I don't want to. I want. I don't want you to have you define all your work because we're going to be talking about about that there. But just tell us a little bit about yourself for anyone in the audience who is not familiar with you. Um, yeah, well, I'm an Australian uh, performance artist, and I guess my interest has always been um, seeing the body not as a as an object of desire, but rather as an object that sh should be redesigned. Um, all of these projects explore alternate anatomical architectures. Uh, so performances with my third hand extended arm, uh, six-legged walking robot, all of these uh, performances explore, you know, what it means to have uh, these uh, kind of different operational architectures. And... I always wanted to, to make a soft prosthesis and, and the idea of constructing an ear, an ear um, I always imagined the ear as a, as a really beautiful facial, facial structure and, and I thought, well, it would be really beautiful to be able to uh, replicate the ear. And initially it was imaged on the side of my head, but this was a, a dumb an anatomical site for an extra ear. Uh, no surgeon would assist me to do that. Um, you know, there was possibility of, of partial face paralysis. Uh, but if we switch to the video now of the ear surgery, uh, you'll get an idea of how this was done. Um, the the uh, uh, MedPore uh, scaffold um, is inserted beneath the skin. Uh, this is a porous uh, biomaterial. And this biomaterial, um, uh, once uh, inserted beneath the skin and the skin is suctioned over the scaffold, um, over a period of six months, you get tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. In other words, uh, the ear becomes fully integrated uh, into your arm. It grows its own blood supply. Um, and in fact, um, as I was discussing with Daniela before, uh, two weeks ago, I had another surgical procedure uh, done to the ear, um, trying to better define the helical area, but also to begin uh, the construction of a, a soft earlobe. Um, and this was done uh, by a, a plastic surgeon and stem cell a researcher in Spain, and uh, I really won't know the outcome of that for about six months, whether good or not. So hopefully the risk of a second surgery isn't going to uh, be, um, be, be negative. But um, as you can see in the video, uh, in, the, in the second surgery, we also had inserted a small microphone into the ear construct, and even though my, um, even, uh, no, 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 don't play the next video, please. Uh, can, can we, can we, can kids. we pause the next video? Because it's, it's yeah, going too fast. Yeah, no, I'll, yeah, I'll prompt you as to when to play the video. So, uh, let's go back. Yeah. So, um, the idea really is to eventually internet enable the ear to reinsert the microphone. I'm working with a grinder a group in the US uh, to develop a, a tip set that can be inserted um, inside, uh, uh, inside the arm uh, with a series of LEDs as well, uh, a tilt sensor, uh, a GPS included. Uh, so uh, this extra ear will be an ear, not for me, but for people in other places, a remote uh, listening device. So mm, the idea of a soft prosthesis uh, is, is, is uh, this result of, a, of an ear on my arm. But, you know, all of these projects really explore uh, how we become complicit uh, with technology in, in various ways, in both very, very physical ways uh, and also uh, in very intimate ways. So the propel performance and play the, the next video, but without sound. Um, in this performance, my body was connected to a, 
a three metre um, industrial robot arm. And the body uh, is choreographed uh, on this uh, robot arm. So in this way, yeah, no sound, please. No sound. Just play the video without the sound. Thank you. Um, so we could uh, precisely program the trajectory, the velocity, the position and orientation of, of the body on, on the robot. Um, this was a very difficult performance to pull off because if you know anything about industrial robot arms, uh, they're quite uh, dangerous and uh, ordinarily you can't even be within the task envelope of a, of, of, of a robot of, of this type. Um, this performance was for 30 minutes. Um, so the speed of, of uh, the body uh, was also varied. Uh, but after the 30 minute choreography with the body, the body was replaced by um, a body scaled ear. This was an ear um, that was laser scanned, that was uh, um, CNC machined. Um, what's interesting about uh, the choreography of the ear was that um, the robot that choreographs the ear is the same robot that carved the ear. <laughs> um, so um, uh, that performance was a, a, a much more a physically a problematic one. Um, with the stick man performance, um, if we can play the next video, please. Uh, this was a, a full body. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, with the Stickman uh, performance, um, uh, we engineered a full body exoskeleton. And um, this full body exoskeleton algorithmically animates the body. This was for a five hour performance. So the body was algorithmically animated continuously um, by a, a program running in the background. But in addition, we had engineered a mini stick man that uh, people uh, could move the limbs of the mini stick man, um, press play and generate or insert their own movements uh, into the uh, choreography, a kind of sort of electronic voodoo. Um, and uh, uh, th this performance um, generated uh, this um, machine body uh, choreography where the body is partly possessed but also partly performing with its own agency because although my uh, uh, two arms and one leg uh, were uh, algorithmically actuated, one leg was free to pivot so I could manipulate my shadow um, projected on the wall behind me and I could also modulate the video feedback uh, that was uh, uh, projected uh, beside that. Um, now, in the Rewired Remix performance, um, several years ago at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art, and we can play that uh, final video. Um, for five days, uh, six hours every day, I could only see with the eyes of someone in London. I could only hear with the ears of someone in New York. But anyone anywhere could access my arm and remotely choreograph it. The video that I'm showing, though, is a more recent one connecting Eindhoven, um, Basel and Antwerp. Um, I could only see with the eyes of someone in Antwerp, only hear with the ears of someone in Basel, but anyone anywhere could access my arm and remotely choreograph it. It was kind of outsourcing your senses um, to people in other places 
and also sharing your agency. If you were in the gallery, you could interact with the body um, using a, a large touch screen. Uh, otherwise, you could go online and, and do that uh, wherever, wherever you were. So on a daily basis, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was going to see. I didn't know what I was going to hear. Um, so this idea of, in a sense, becoming this kind of extended operational system of distributed agency and shared uh, sensory experience um, was the, the kind of uh, the conceptual raison d'etre for doing this. Well, you know, one of the things that, keep, that kept coming to mind when I'm, when I'm hearing every one of these projects is trust. And you are giving a lot of trust to other people to, to, to interact with your body. And I want to understand how you, um, how you uh, have accepted that or if you have accepted that, you know, why are you, why are you offering this to complete strangers, both from ha like what you're going to be doing, having people listen to your body all the time to um, people remotely sending things to you to move your body, I mean, that's a lot of, to me, that's an enormous um, an initiative. Well, I think it's, um, yeah, for me, it's not so much an issue of, of trust or who's in control, uh, but, but rather this idea of um, problematizing what a body is and how a body operates in the world, because we're no longer uh, merely biological bodies. Um, you know, we've been uh, augmented, amplified. We're now being invaded by micro and, and nano, nano sensors and nano mechanisms. Um, so really the, the body is this uh, much more extended system of interaction. Um, and, and that's really what these performances try to, 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 to explore really. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna. I have one audience comment here. This one is from uh, Professor Francisco Brugonoli from the Contemporary Art Museum of Santiago, Chile. He. It's more of a comment. He says Stellog's creations are very interesting because they question us not only about the unique body in the traditional way, but also about the expanded, mediated technologies that make us wonder what space, what body. Uh, and and uh, also, I think because we're um, Stellark is not going to be able to stay uh, for the entire session. If we do have mm -hmm. any questions from the audience, um, uh, please also comment on that so we can um, bring that forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that you know that is an interesting. I don't know if you have any response to his comment, uh, but I think it kind of actually connects to what you just said. Well, I think I, I, it, it's it's sort of an interesting time, I think, because we're sort of living in an age of of circular, what I call circulating flesh, where we can take organs from one body and insert them into other bodies, where we can stitch the hands of a cadaver to the arms of an amputee and reanimate them. Um, it's also a time of prosthetic flesh, where increasingly now. Uh, bodies of these contemporary constructs, these contemporary chimeras of meat, metal and code. Uh, it's also a time of fractal flesh where bodies and bits of bodies are spatially separated but electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. And it's also a time of now of phantom flesh where increasingly we we're experiencing ourselves as our digital doppelgangers um, mm -hmm. by phantom flesh. I don't mean phantasmatic, but rather experiencing our bodies as kind of phantom limb extensions. Um, uh, so uh, in fact, fan, you know, to others online, we appear as, as these flickering phantoms um, sort of switching on and off, you know, as if these are glitches in biological time, this sort of digital noise that's invading 
our biological you know, existence. In fact, all sorts of digital organisms, uh, digital entities uh, are now invading the human microbiome and contaminating us in all sorts of interesting ways. <laughs> yeah, it, it, a, a lot of these fantasies that people have sort of um, concocted over, over over decades are actually just a, a complete reality now. And I think you know that that here, so we're 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 not our body is not ourselves anymore. There, it's just it's really mixed. I, I agree with a, a lot of what you just mentioned. Um, one other question I have is what ideas um, have all these performances generated and how have they affected your outlet? Or your outlet, um, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I think um, issues of, of embodiment, <clears throat> agency and identity, are, I guess, are issues that constantly come up with, with these um, projects and performances. I mean, uh, I, uh, what's interesting now is, is, is is that the body exists in 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 strange times where where the the dead, the near dead, the not yet born, and the partially living, are all existing, you know, simultaneously, um, and 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 in proximity to each other, um, and also in proximity to. Um, machines uh, where we're increasingly developing sophisticated machine musculature, um, sensory systems and rudimentary intelligence where these machines, these, these uh, robots, these biomimicked uh, uh, um, uh, entities uh, will increasingly interact with us. So there are these uh, different kinds of life forms uh, that we now have to interact with. And what's intriguing for me is what minimum vocabulary of behaviour generates this sense of aliveness, whether it's in bodies or, or, or machines. Interesting. Uh, I, we have one other question from the audience. Um, the question is, what are you making now? Or is I, I know you just mentioned the RWRM project. Is that your most recent work, or do you have another project in the works? Well, <laughs> um, well uh, the 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 Stick Man Mini Stick Man, the Rewide Remix performance is a very recent uh, project. Um, the, the, the surgery to my ear occurred only two weeks ago. Um, it's a project that was begun in 1996, so it's taking a long time to, to realise. So that's always an ongoing project that, that uh, you know, hopefully will be completed and will be uh, wired up and operational. Uh, I keep saying in a year... Um, I have no idea now because uh, with every surgical procedure takes quite a, a long time before we, we, we know the outcome. Um, so really the way that I work is, is with this kind of posture of indifference where I allow things to happen in their own time with their own rhythm. I don't have expectations. I don't plot the future. Um, I just uh, I, I just function as an opportuni opportunistic artist that um, is is open to any possibilities that that might that might occur. Um, so really, there, there's nothing that I'm planning for in in some imagined future. I think the present is a handful to manage. <laughs> It definitely is. You know, it, it, it's good that you're avail you're able to work in the now with such a a, a real insight or um, to actually what's happening towards the future. I think a lot of what you're 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 addressing is 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 um, is true, but it's also really something that hasn't been uh, completely made aware of on a on a public level as something that we are you know we're all living in this sort of this this disparate. Um, environment where where everything around our bodies and what our bodies are and how they perform and how they connect to you know technology in the most micro level and the most macro level, it's still quite um, 
something that people have not been able to to, to really take in as um as, as the reality of where we are right now. Um, some some may yeah, say think, this I, is I, still very science yeah. fiction. You know, go ahead. It's it's just um, that one project uh, generates iterations for for other artworks. Um, in fact, the the the, the, the support structure on the industrial robot arm uh, generated the idea for the stick man exoskeleton, the minimal full body exoskeleton. Uh, so a support structure becomes an exoskeleton uh, in, in, in its future iteration. So one idea leads to another. Um, and also the, the ideas that I've been speaking about can only be authenticated by the actions uh, that the artist uh, 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 performs. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, if, unless somebody has a burning question. OK, so I want to thank you, uh, Stellar, for, for taking the time to connect with us today. And if you have time to stay on and listen to some of the other speakers, you're welcome to. And I understand if you have to jump off, because it is quite late. Um, I wish I could actually ask a million more questions, but this is a really a good um, and, and opportunity for to, to really introduce your work along with these other artists. Who's, you know, I could see a lot of connections between the other um, presenters today. So thank you very much. No, thank you, and I, I really apologize not being able to stay on because I've got some early morning stuff to do. So it, it, it's a bit difficult. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, and, and um, I certainly know some of the artists who you're speaking to, um, so I'm sorry to miss the others. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Have, have a good evening. Good night. <laughs> thank you. All right. So now we're going to welcome Anna Dimitrio. Uh, uh, Anna, Dimitri. welcome. Dimitrio, yeah, sorry. Apologize. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I, I'd like to first of all welcome you, and then uh, let's we'll start by having you just for the for the audience who is not as familiar with your work, if you sh could share a little bit about yourself, and then we can start. Um, um, we can we can initiate the slideshow, uh, and we're going to kind of talk through that slideshow as it runs. Right? Okay. Well, I think just leave it running in the background is fine. Okay. That's yeah, because it's just on a loop. So you can see okay, the go images. ahead. T tell us a little bit about yourself, and I'll, I'll, I'll have them start this right now. So, yeah, I'm an artist based in the UK. Um, I've been working for, uh, I would say, quite a long time, um, um, embedded in uh, microbiology settings. So I trained in fine art originally, and um, I've always had a kind of fascination slash, I suppose, about um, these kind of as bacteria infectious diseases maybe it's kind of hypochondria i don't know um but the more i um started to investigate bacteria the more obsessed i became with them and the fascinating things that they can do the fascinating stories around them and also the histories of infectious diseases so my work often kind of draws threads across time so um I'm very interested in the early history, treatment of disease, things like that. But I'm also very interested in the cutting edge technologies happening now, things like whole genome sequencing, CRISPR gene editing, um, things like that. Um, growing teeth from bacteria in the lab, you can see an image there. Um, whole genome sequencing bacteria. Um, I learn all the techniques hands on. I'm very um, interested in participatory work as well, bringing people's stories into um into the work and the projects and bringing stories in and kind of storytelling um and i work all hands-on with pathogenic organisms mainly i'm artist in residence on the modernizing medical microbiology project at oxford university i'm artist in residence on uh with the national collection of type cultures um in the uk which is the oldest and most historic collection of pathogenic microorganisms in the world. Um, so a type culture is like the original bacteria, so the original strain of something. When you identify something for the first time, 
that's the type culture. Um, some of the type cultures aren't the super, super original, like with the E. coli, it's, um, it's one similar to that because the original was lost. But um, they have, um, for instance, the famous bacteria that um, Barry Marshall um, drank, the Helicobacter pylori bacteria that he drank to prove that um, uh, that, that could cause stomach ulcers. Um, they have um, strains of Yersinia pestis, which is plague, the Black Death, and I'm currently making a plague dress um, impregnated with plague DNA that I extracted in the lab. Um, I work a lot with Category 2 organisms as well, so you've got these different levels of biosafety. You've got Category 1, which is basically your everyday world is kind of like Category 1, so these are the non-pathogenic bugs. Category 2 are pathogenic organisms. I organisms that can hurt you um but can usually be cured with antibiotics um and cat category three are microorganisms that are very difficult to cure um or quite dangerous microorganisms such as uh yersinia pestis plague um or uh tuberculosis which is another bacterium i work with a lot very important in the history of infectious diseases so yeah that's basically a bit of background to what I do. <laughs> so I have a question on the infectious, you know, when you're working with these infectious diseases, I, I, I mean, how, can you go into a little bit more detail? I mean, because mm -hmm. working with, with plague bacteria, you, you would think that there's a lot of danger there. You know, I, th I, I, I think about working with the plague and what well, if yeah. that. <laughs> share share, share yeah. about how that works. <laughs> I don't, yeah. yeah. So, well, with plague, I've handled it live previously, um, and that you would need to be you're double gloved and you're under negative pressure. You have to sell it. You have to kind of gaffer tape your um, gloves to your lab coat, and then you're inside usually a glove box working under negative pressure. So even if the glove becomes cut in some way or something, the air would suck the the dangerous microorganisms out through a HEPA filter, which traps them. So this is how they do biocontainment, the level three. It's a sealed room. Um, you can take notes in there, but you have to fax the notes outside. So you can you can fax your notes to yourself outside. Um, the camera, if you take photographs, you'll see in the trust. No, in one of the trust me, I'm an artist. Shots is me handling plague. It's we with a yellow glove on, holding a red petri dish. I don't know if it's in this, um, but. Uh, uh, you could take photos, but the camera is their camera and they need to fumigate it using like um, formaldehyde kind of spray um, before it's allowed out, before they can access it. For extracting the DNA, we kill the microorganism first. So I'm extracting the DNA from the dead plague, which is the same thing. In terms of DNA, it's exactly the same stuff, it's the code. And then DNA. Because it's just the extracted DNA, that doesn't have any infectious elements in it. It's the it's the it's just the code that tells you how to make it. So I'm able to use that in my artworks, and I have all the proofs necessary from the most significant labs in the UK that work with these things to show that this is all completely safe and approved. So I work very closely with leading scientists to do that. But I do it and all that's hands a really on myself. Unique, they let me. <laughs> that's a unique opportunity to be able to do that and to ha and and to be able to be trained in that. And so, um, so once I mean, I, I noticed that a lot of a lot of a lot of these end up coming into the form of crafts. So, can you talk a little bit more about how um, how, how you're connecting science to craft? Well, I think a lot of it comes from. It's kind of there's a little bit of a kind of feminist side to it, really, because um, in the kind of the early days of science, or even now, if you, if you look at it, but in the early days of science, when um, men were their natural philosophers, um, there there were relatively fewer women, or that if they were doing it, they were doing it a bit more under the radar. I like to kind of uncover those stories as well. Um, but at that time, and and um, Rajika makes the point. Uh, part makes the point in the book the subversive stitch at the time actual philosophers were doing all this science women were um kind of their 
highest level of achievement was a proficiency in white work embroidery, this very fine detailed craft. And actually, contemporary science is very similar to very detailed craft. Um, these, you have to, basically, biology is pipetting. It's, it's being really good at pipetting or getting somebody who's really good at pipetting. So it's like using these little devices and taking tiny, tiny amounts of things and adding them to other tiny, tiny amounts of things, adding them up, uh, heating them up, cooling them down and adding things basically is, is kind of how it all works uh, these days with the, with the sort of, yeah, with the genetics research or, or genetic modification. Um, and so actually the same processes that you feel um, when you're doing kind of very detailed craft techniques are very similar. So I kind of was interested in exploring doing the science, but through these craft technologies, uh, these craft techniques as well. So, um, and also it's a really nice way of showing it and it bringing in different audiences who um, who are kind of enticed in through the, the craft techniques to reach this work that would normally probably put them off. So there's this nice tension there that I quite enjoy. Yeah, I can see that. And they're, 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 they have that element of delicacy, but once you get a, close to them, it, it, you really kind of become incredibly curious. Mm. And even and, you know, from the materials to, the, um, to how that process was connected. Um, mm. I also want to note that we, we're getting to a point where we can start to open up for any audience questions. So if anyone who is on the live stream has a question, please um, let us know. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question, though, and that's talking about the unknown in your work. So how do you manage the unknown in your work? Well, I kind of just let it happen, I think. <laughs> that would be uh, uh, the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of unknown with um, working with bacteria is that, um, I mean, after a while you get to know what it's kind of going to do, but I'm using this, stuff to, like, that image that you've got up at the moment, the one that you just had with these kind of, um, it's, it's uh, linen crochet um, and they've been, it's kind of covered with something that's made it solid and hard there. That's actually a Clostridium difficile biofilm. So we grew that, we placed it inside a jar in a kind of gut model where they um, see the effects of Clostridium difficile and antibiotics on the human gut. And it produces these massive biofilms, which are the, one of the reasons it's so hard to treat. It's a superbug, causes terrible diarrhea and is one of the things that's famous for being able to cure it using these human fecal transplants, which is becoming kind of increasingly known. That's an artwork that actually uses a human, has a fe human fecal plant in it. But these biofilms, like nobody's ever tried to make a sculpture using a Clostridium difficile biofilm before, and we didn't know how it would work, um, what the best way to sterilize it would be. But we had a kind of idea that it would be interesting to try it and see what would happen and we ended up sterilizing the entire jar with the lace grown in it um and then drying the lace out afterwards and it has actually formed these really solid structures the biofilm which is kind of fascinating um and the reason it's it's on linen lace is because um the bacteria that is responsible for making linen is um, is called Clostridium, and it's the same spe It's the same sort of genus as Clostridium difficile. But it's a different Clostridium, and Clostridium means spindle, and you use spindles in lace making. So I've I've made all these kind of things. I've got an exhibition opening at our space in Lisbon in Northern Ireland for the Northern Ireland Linen Biennial uh, next week. So all these works that are there referencing linen have this this link to it that piece as well that you can just say um yeah but it's yeah it's using it. these materials and just kind of going with it i guess a lot of the time i don't know what they're going to look like until until i start doing it and then i get a feel for it as i'm it's like using it's like using different paints but you've got to imagine that every paint is 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 alive and is going to grow in a different way or has all these different things and they don't even they don't like each 
so you can't grow two. People always have these ideas, they can make a nice, nice pattern or something with one next to another, but sometimes they'll interact. I'm not interested in that kind of decorative side, I'm interested in the storytelling behind that, I think. Yeah, I think that's really, I think the storytelling is actually really helps people connect everything together. I really, in, um, and I think you do a really incredible job at that. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about is when you first started working with different researchers and, and labs, um, how did you start to build those relationships and build the trust? Um, I know you you um, had this longer, longer project called Trust Me, I'm an Artist, but even prior to that, um, building those relationships so where you could where you could where they where they did start to let an artist into this super hazard bio lab that's not that's not like it's something you just call them up and say hey i'm doing the project no. and i come over and do this no i mean can you walk us a little bit through the beginning of that yeah i i wanted this is it's going back quite a long time so it's going back to sort of when we first started to have the access to the internet that was sort of of any kind of speed that you could Google something. But I mean, there wasn't that much. And then I started to kind of find out a bit more about bacteria than you would normally like, than the press want us to know or the TV or the advertisers want us to know. And every time I looked at these stories of the bacteria in a little bit more detail, I would find that actually the story was the complete opposite often to how it was presented to us in the newspaper and that's something that really fascinates me so i approached um the medical school i approached some scientists um at the medical school here and after a little while i was in to dr john paul who um i've been working with for about 15 years now um he's just retired but he was the um regional microbiologist for London and the southeast of England by the time he retired. So he was in charge of all microbiology services for Public Health England for, for the biggest region in, in the UK. Um, but he wasn't when we first started working together. He was a hospital um, consultant then. And a consultant means that it's sort of a, a, a higher doctor. Um, an important doctor is called a consultant here. I think it doesn't translate necessarily in other language that had this problem in Canada, <laughs> trying to explain what a consultant was. Um, and uh, so I worked with him for a long time. And then through that and through just my obsession and my interest and my progress with my work, um, more and more people have kind of contacted me or I've spoken to people or I've met people. And so it's reached a stage now where I have these relationships and uh, normally um, scientists will also approach me to work together or I meet them through other contacts. I really like kind of organic collaborations to kind of form. Um, so they're not forced. There's a, it's an interesting thing, this sort of issue of curated collaborations where we're going to put an artist together with a scientist. Um, and sometimes that doesn't go so well, I think. Um, sometimes it does. It's luck in those situations, I think. Um, but the sort of more curated, uh, the more natural um, collaborations, I think, are, are the way to go, ideally. Uh, but yeah, it takes a long time. And like we're saying about how these, you know, you have these ideas rattling around in your head. Um, and I, I'm not sort of, I, I sort of push things a bit, but I'm not like desperately pushing things. I'm waiting for the right moment where an idea can sort of evolve. You know, I thought of things years ago and then now they're sort of coming to the fore. It's like when I first wanted to work with TB, um, it wasn't legal or possible, but then things changed and the science made it possible for me to use the extract DNA. Um, and it was my collaborators that were doing that. Then I could incorporate it into um, into a, into my art safely and tell the story of their research through it. So it sort of it moves along organically with what's possible in the science too. When I first thought about removing an antibiotic resistance gene from a bacterium, that kind of predated CRISPR um, being possible. And I've subsequently been able to use CRISPR gene editing to do something called homologous recombination edit on a uh, bacterial genome to remove an antibiotic resistance gene to repair it back to its pre-1941 state. Um, so 
So it's just sort of a matter of biding your time, I think, as well, sort of okay. just being patient. Well, th thank you so much, Anna. I, 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 w I would love to hear more. We do have, we, we actually have to move on to the, the next presenter, but I, um, I, I want to encourage everybody for us to take this offline and continue this dialogue because um, this, is, this could actually be in an all day discussion. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And, and I hope you. you stay on to, 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 to hear Nina and Tiara next. Um, so I think the next uh, presenter is Nina, right? Is that right? The, Dylan's check it, checking in. We, oh, Tiare, uh, Tiare. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Tiare. Apologies. Okay. All right. Hi. Um, um, welcome, Tiare. I wanted you to start by just giving an introduction about yourself and letting those who aren't familiar with you get an idea of um, who you are, and then we can and we can start um, going into the presentation right up um, immediately. Actually, you can start to turn on the slideshow. Go ahead. Oh, I can't hear you. You're you're muted. Hold on a second. You're muted. Uh, can you unmute her? Okay, yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Hi everyone. Thank you, Danielle, so much for the invitation. And um, you guys can feel free to actually roll my slides. I'll let you guys control it on that end. Um, it's an, it's an honor to be here and with such um, established uh, artists in the field. Um, I actually have a background with textiles as well. Um, I'm originally from Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, started to um, just really teach myself how to make garments at a young age. Nothing quite fit me. And um, I came from a background where we were uh, buying and selling clothes kind of at thrift stores and at the markets um, to, to make rent uh, with my grandmother and my mother, all women kind of uh, single mom, two single moms, my cousin and my grandma. And um, I really had this affinity for textiles. Um, and in Hawaii, I also grew up um, around uh, the ocean and um, around uh, all these different water bodies. So if you can go to the next slide, um, some of the first works I did really were inspired by uh, all of these different uh, bodies of water that I grew up around. Um, I grew up in Honolulu, which was nestled between the jungle and the ocean, basically, the rainforest and the ocean. So um, when I left the city, I was uh, really close to um, rivers, waterfalls, and the ocean. And uh, subconsciously or not, um, that these water bodies in the ocean really informed my work. Um, throughout my lifetime. And uh, I'll come back to that later. Um, I have done some work since then um, with uh, 3D printing. Um, if you can move to the next slide. And um, these works, this work in particular, um, started to in explore the geological landscapes that our technologies originate from, such as the Bayan Obo mining district uh, in Inner Mongolia, where the largest deposits of our rare earth minerals come from. Um, our consumer technologies are really uh, powered by these minerals uh, that create the small and powerful magnets, capacitors, speakers um, in you know, our smartphones, our our hybrid cars, our laptops. Um, and I kind of wanted to create um, an intimate encasement for uh, our, our most used and disposed of uh, consumer technologies. Uh, so I brought that into um, close contact with a uh, uh, 3D printed smartphone case um, in this case. And I was really drawn to kind of like the raw elements of technologies uh, in this piece and um, in a, a a work in progress in, in collaboration with Sarobi Saraf. Uh, we are going to explore this, uh, the materiality of technology at the F Center for Material, um, Center for Emotional Materiality um, in the fall coming up. Um, I also have created uh, browser based experience, experiences um, that explored uh, the global supply chain and internet infrastructure told through a series of interactive uh, puzzles um, and scenes, um, as well as created an augmented reality experience, um, 
where um, that took place along um, the estuary estuary park in the San Francisco Bay Trail. Um, I'm based out of uh, the San Francisco and uh, Oakland for almost a decade now. Um, and in this project, I was um, pulled back to the ocean and uh, was interested in these kind of anomalies that happened with um, uh, these large infrastructural systems. So container spill accidents and um, the creatures that live next to um, the submarine cables that uh, uh, the fiber optic submarine cables that connect us uh, globally. Um, so um, I, I don't have the screen share enabled, but I was going to share some interactive scenes from that. But if you go to um, Ubic City, which is in, in two slides from here, um, you can see kind of links to those projects. Um, and this was a fun. Um, in this slide here, this was a, a fun kind of like interactive experience where you could, it was a scavenger hunt for these, these organisms that usually are hidden un, under the ocean in the deep sea, but again, like to live uh, next to um, these infrastructures. Um, brittle stars, uh, sea pigs, uh, sea anemones, things like that. Um, now, going back to the ocean and going back to more of a biospace, uh, my current work is, sorry, move, please move forward with the slideshow. Um, my current work um, is focused on cyanobacteria, actually. Um, and these are ancient organisms that were the first to actually create oxygen on the planet through photosynthesis and through endosymbiosis became the chloroplasts that exist in all plants today. Um, I recently did an artist exchange in Kiev, Ukraine, where uh, algae blooms of cyanobacteria um, proliferate in the Dnieper River, which runs through all of Ukraine. And it's um, a, a phenomenon that happens kind of synergistically with rising ocean climates, um, with rising temp, with just uh, during hot hot water, and it's it's a. It's a phenomenon that exists globally, but um, something that I wanted to explore in this specific place in Ukraine is with the American Arts Incubator, which is an international exchange uh, that sends artists to different countries uh, globally. And I was lucky enough to work with Isa Liatsia in Kiev and uh, 33 different artists there uh, who actually helped me create uh, an exhibition. We created a collaborative exploration um, exhibition exploring these um, this phenomenon of um, harmful algal blooms through speculative design. Um, and these uh, included 3D prints, uh, video projections, um, and also some uh, microbial footage. Um, <laughs> So, um, are, we, are we going too fast for your slides? Just checking. No, no. Um, yeah. it, they're, they were just a little out of order. So, to give you just okay. a little bit more of a background, um, so I did um, work as a lab technician, um, just pure research, um, super growing algae uh, to convert to biodiesel on the Big Island of Hawaii um, 10 years ago, kind of when this research was fairly new. And um, that, that was just kind of like pure science, um, doing the research and getting really intimate, kind of watching over these small micro microalgal growths uh, for 12 hour long days. Um, and then uh, five years later, I went to Puget Sound and I um, studied harmful algal blooms um, off, off the coast of, of Puget Sound in the form of dinoflagellates. Um, so I really was introduced to these, um, these creatures kind of behind the scenes, not as an artist, but had always wanted to um, bring them into my artwork and, and integrate them into s living artworks or explorations. And that's really what brought me to this place when I was in Ukraine to study these works. Um, so <laughs> here's uh, the exhibition that, uh, we did in Kiev. And as I mentioned, it was uh, really interdisciplinary. There were a lot of, of works um, shown across all um, different mediums. And um, they, 
I wanted to look, I created some laser cut portraits of the Dnieper River where algal growths uh, really were more pronounced. Um, so, so here we're kind of seeing um, from satellite view uh, regions of the river um, that, that have uh, some uh, big issues with the harmful algal blooms of cyanobacteria. Um, I also uh, did some layering with uh, vinyl of uh, ancient flows and modern and man-made flows of the river, juxtaposing um, these flows, and what and um, also created a kind of a water battery out of polluted river, um, polluted river water, um, just to kind of show kind of like a transformation of, of pollution into energy. Um, so this, this was kind of a speculative project, but, but one water battery did work. Um, and feel free to just kind of move quickly through the slides if you like at this point. Um, so again, um, artists in my group had um, explored also through textiles, um, different uh, digital realizations of the, this, this phenomenon. And after the exhibition, I really wanted to get uh, not just these laser cut portraits, but microbial portraits of the, the river. So I collected water samples from those uh, satellite image views um, from, from different parts of Kiev, from the north and south of, uh, of Kiev. And I put them under the microscope and uh, took some, some video of the, um, the organisms as they kind of uh, moved and squiggled um, under, um, <laughs> under the microscope. We, we don't have to watch too much of it because I, I don't want to take up too much time here. Um, but I was just really fascinated by these forms, the cyanobacteria, the long filamentous strands. And I just became like obsessed with, with these organisms. And as, as Anna was talking about, you know, our increasingly biotechnological landscape where gene editing is something that you can, you can order a kit online these days, um, and synthetic biology is also um, exploring ways that, um, uh, you know, and, um, some uh, cyanobacteria could maybe be integrated or photosynthetic organisms could be integrated into animal cells. I also wanted to consider um, maybe what that would look like um, speculatively if, if humans were to become less human and more like slime. And uh, if we were to start to integrate cyanobacteria into our bodies and they stayed. Um, and I just I currently want to imagine a really slimier future, one where we acknowledge our microbial populations that exist inside of us, one where um, we become less than human and um, this work with the cyanobacteria has really brought me to that space. And I hope to go back to Kiev and, and explore this further. Thank you. <laughs> uh, th thanks, Tiara. That's really, that's really interesting and very connected into a lot of the whole idea that we're thinking about today around uh, bacteria, microbes, and, and how do we actually understand them and, and how, what is our relationship with them as humans? Um, I want to also open it up to anybody on live stream who has any questions, and um, uh, and I can relate those out. Do we have anybody on the, on the live feed? So uh, I don't. I'm not sure if we have anybody yet, but I I, I think that one of the things that that that's interesting um, about your work and and how it kind of connects back into the. Um, Okay, there's a lot of people. A lot of people saying hi to you on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of TRA fans. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's also connecting the back, you know, the bacteria into these into these textile forms. And I think this is something that we're seeing more and more of. Is like, how do we, you know, kind of the idea of wearing our bacteria externally? How do we, you know, make it get more visible? I mean, we're 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 completely made up of bacteria, but then. Um, and, 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 and microbes, and now there's this opportunity for us to wear it. So what does it mean to wear something microbial, right? Like, how does that, what does that mean? Yeah, well, I mean, our microbes are 
are pretty much invisible and that we're, you know, out of sight, out of mind. There's not something that the common person thinks about every day. Yet they are, you know, crossing membranes with us. I think they are um, affecting our, you know, our psychologies even. I know my cravings are certainly controlled by my um, microbial gut bacteria. So it, thinking about visualizing them and um, thinking about uh, bringing them to the surface um, making them a bit macro, like I did with uh, the sort of the last slides where it's, I've, I've um, ma made them a lot larger and appear on the body. I just think we'll help with, with more conversation around them. We'll um, just, just make them more visible. And, and I, I, just, I just think we'll shift that relationship we have with them. Um, and it's a much needed shift of perspectives to this multi-species space. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, that's, <laughs> it's a future I all think right. we all want in this room. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to, speaking of multi-species, uh, I'm going to um, start to, we're going to transition over to Nina. And then after um, Nina talks, we'll have a little bit more uh, uh, time to discuss. Well, one, one second. Um, so there's, there's, one, there's one comment says uh, to you, it says, in the final slide, you were suggesting that these microbes as augmenting garments or as integrated into the skin. Um, I guess that's a comment from Laura, from Laura Wright. Oh, hi, Laura. Um, Laura was actually uh, part of the American Artist Incubator and went to India to uh, work with uh, artists abroad as well. Very international. Uh, program. Um, but I was speculating how to integrate them into the skin or the body, and the garments were just kind of displaying that speculation. So that, that one garment that I had showed was really bio just bioplastics with, with gelatin and glycerol, and there was, there was no actual, um, it, that, you know, that wasn't actually my skin, but it, it's a speculation of, of how that might look. Um, so I, you know, um, Anna was saying that she had worked with uh, scientists, and I, I would like to move into that space when possible. And I think, you know, we can start to get really um, interesting results when those um, borders are crossed, when you have artists collaborating with scientists and make new discoveries. And I hope for that to be something in um, the future of my uh, practice. Great, thank you very much. Um, oh, I think did did Anna have to leave? Oh, I think she did. She did mention. All right. Sorry. Anna, Anna just left. But thank you, Tore. Um, I'm going to bring in Nina next, and then we can open it up to a broader discussion. Uh, so um, can we get can we get the presentations switched between with, with Nina's presentation up? And Nina, if you want to unmute yourself. You're muted still. Uh, not on my end. Okay. Yeah. Good. You're good. You're good. Well, okay. You, good. Oh. Okay. You're good. Great. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Tiara. That was re really. There's so many questions I could ask because we had like hours. Um, okay. So if you go ahead, load the slides. So Nina, what would be great if you could just tell our audience a little bit about yourself for those who aren't familiar with you, and then we can start going into your presentation. Sure. Um, and the, you'll see when we start the presentation, there's a couple slides that uh, after the very beginning that have some images connected to my background, which is that um, so I danced very seriously when I was younger. Um, ballet, total nerdy ballet at uh, studying with the New York City Ballet. And you can go ahead and start the presentation. Actually, if you jump forward a couple slides, then we'll see some images that go with what I'm saying now. Um, so j past that, we'll come back to that just keep bouncing till you see an image of a dancer. Um, but anyway, so I studied ballet very seriously. At the same time, I was a real math and science geek. Um, and I just pursued both of these with no idea that they might ever come together. Keep, no, keep going forward, please. Um, and so I went, I just wanted to trace a slightly circuitous route because I think um, sometimes people don't realize like how uh, following your interests, no matter how varied they might be, you can come up with uh, a perspective on the world that is useful and exciting to you because it draws from all that background. So next slide, please. 
that's to me as a dancer next um, this is so I um, I finished uh, studying with the city ballet and I decided I wasn't going to do it for a career I was going to go to college but I decided to take off a year in New York because I was voraciously curious about people and one of my best friends was Jackie Curtis um, one of the drag queens who performed in Warhol's movies and Jackie who sometimes performed as a boy sometimes as a girl took me all around New York I had had a fairly sheltered life up till then and all of a sudden I just saw the incredible range of lives and perspectives. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most exciting years of my lives. Um, and next slide, please. Um, it sort of laid the ground for me. Um, instead of going, I had planned to go to MIT to pursue math and science. And instead I ended up going to Harvard, a liberal arts school because I realized I didn't know nothing about people and I wanted to learn a lot more about that. So I ended up actually, next slide please, with a focus in anthropology cultural anthropology, not, not the study of bones, and, um, and filmmaking. Um, and so, so these, uh, next slide please, these uh, different threads uh, sort of pushed me when I got out of school into the arts. I knew I needed to land somewhere in the arts. Um, uh, I wasn't going to do ballet. I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be filmmaking or what. So I took a job bartending, which a lot of artists do. And this also was invaluable, really, for my research uh, as it is today. Because, And I recommend uh, all artists on the younger side to take jobs in the service business um, just because you develop your skills of uh, listening to people and learning about people, understanding different perspectives. Um, so now we could back up. Uh, to the first slide, there's a teeny bit of video there. And I'm going to talk about how this stuff sort of comes. If you could back up to the beginning, please. Um, I just want to show a little clip of Charlie Chaplin as a way to talk about physical thinking. So if we play that video, please. Oh, I don't think we have sound. That's OK. There's some lovely music playing, <laughs> which actually, there you go. So a master of physical thinking. Next slide, please. So that was Chaplin, a master of physical thinking. And I'll talk for a minute about that scene. But just to get at this idea of what is physical thinking, what would uh, a neuroscientist think about this, about Chaplin here? He might approach it differently. Um, Rodolfo Linus, uh, who is the chairman emeritus of physiology and neuroscience at NYU, um, talks about the uh, idea that our so-called creativity, our innovations, actually come from um, gestural memory and in a very specific and interesting way. Anything you've learned to do, uh, walking, brushing your teeth, typing, or in Chaplin's case, um, tightening the nuts with his wrench, all those gestural um, skills are embedded in the brain. They're recorded in the basal ganglia, a group of neurons. And uh, neuro, um, uh, Linus calls these gestural motor tapes. And these motor tapes play in your brain all the time, not all of them at once, but at a given moment, one or two different gestural memories can play at once. So leading you to sort of see the world through a different pattern. So if one memory, uh, gestural memory, you could think of it as like a circle, and the other one is maybe like got lines. And if you look at the world through that overmesh of those two patterns, the world looks different. Of course, it's much more complicated because these are physical memories in your body. But uh, here, I, what I was so excited about this uh, to think about is that here is gesture and movement in a very critical place in the, the development of our mind, a trigger for creative thinking. So to learn any new way of think moving may launch a new kind of family of thoughts or a logic. Next slide, please. Um, Ramachandran at UCSD, another neuroscientist, um, talks about another uh, way that gesture is very important. And when I say gesture, I mean movement, like my gestures now, but walking, even posture. 
um, that the the center for gesture in the brain, um, uh, there's the angular gyrus, which is a triangular shape in the brain, a structural phenomenon, and it links um, the centers for processing uh, visual information, sonic information, and movement. And what that means is that those inf the information that comes through those three areas is abstracted and easily shuttles between them. So there's a common sort of rhythm or metrics um, that, or an abstraction that allows these different senses to understand each other. And I'll give you an example. Next slide, please. Um, Ramachandran talks about the Martian alphabet. And so he presents this all over the world. I've presented it in many places too, uh, on, <laughs> just to point out, um, if we have this Martian alphabet and I tell you that one of those letters is Booba and one of them is Kiki, or even if I don't have the image and I say, one of these things is called Booba and one is called Kiki. If I ask which one is called Booba, if I could see you all, whenever I do this, everyone in the audience will say it's this one, no matter what language they speak, because that soft sound of booba, we correlate with a soft form, whether I do it gesturally or you see it drawn. So here is uh, an illustration of how this logic shifts between sound, movement, and form. Um, and he points out that this kind of abstraction is the foundation for abilities we have, such as language and all the abstractions that we use to understand life. So um, now we can bounce quickly over those slides we just saw. Um, and I'll talk about some of the core ideas right now. Well, I'll talk about a couple of quick projects. Um, so I'm really interested. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. Um, in in trying to um, get walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and lead my audience to be able to do the same so that we might get uh, an embodied perspective of somebody else's point of view. So next slide, please. So this project, um, Dictation and Training, I, I'll just speak very quickly. I set up a situation whereby I would try to walk in different people's footsteps. I would just hear the sound, but I would not see them walking. So. I have a, a background as a trained dancer. People would walk in all kinds of crazy ways, and I would try to anticipate their step, which sometimes was very easy, sometimes almost impossible. And what I loved about it is that it, it retrained my body or untrained my body so that I would first have a perspective of almost like a toddler who could hardly walk and then get a taste of the perspective of this other person as I took on their way of walking only based on the sound. I would then present the video with both of us moving in tandem. Um, so you see a little bit of that. Um, so, but we can jump to the next slide, please, just because time is short. You can find all these videos on my site. Um, I did that first in that very simple low-tick way because I had in mind to make a project where as you walk down a path, another sound, somebody else's footstep would replace your own. Um, and so I, I rigged up this path that I've shown in different places, and it uses very cheap um, little piezo mics you can get for like 10 cents online. And those record uh, the actual footstep of the person walking and, and um, replace that sound with um, recordings of women in high heels, um, uh, legions of soldiers marching, et cetera. Um, so we're going to skip this and just go to the next. I just had that up there for an image, sorry. Um, then another project I wanted to mention that helped lead to the ideas on my current work was Between Bodies. Next slide, please. And you can bounce through these slides now. Um, this was a project uh, where I worked at the um, just south of the San Diego border in Tijuana um, and was very fascinated in the relationship between the bodies of people and the labor and the lives of people in Tijuana and how it connects to the lives of people in the U.S. Because the media was portraying Tijuana as a place um, to be feared at great distance where people were different. And in fact, that was insane. It was a place full of uh, amazing people, um, highly productive and who producing uh, all kinds of projects that our lives depend on at low cost. And so I wanted to put the sounds of those people's lives in dialogue with people who move through the exhibit. So if you could bounce through the next slides, please, you'll see 
um, there's somebody just walking through, and the next couple of slides will give you a sense of the kinds of sounds they might hear. So this woman walking through is hearing sounds of construction. Next slide. Um, here we have a sound, somebody's walking, and they hear the sound of a boy walking through uh, a, a village uh, on the border, of, on the edge of Tijuana. Um, but what was interesting to me in this project, I showed it in Sao Paulo and Brazil. I showed it in um, Orange County, a very conservative uh, town where a lot of people think that uh, they, they, th they have racist perspective. And yet people became very engaged. For example, here you have a child and she's hearing the sound of somebody jump roping. People come into a sort of movement dialogue because those sensors that you see hanging allow them to trigger the sound and change the pitch or speed or volume of the sound of somebody jump roping. So they end up in a kind of a moving because they end up in a sort of gestural dialogue with another body. So I was trying to connect these two bodies over distance through movement um, and, and taking away these sort of cultural prejudices. And it seemed to have changed some people's mind in Orange County, which was very exciting. Um, and in, in Sao Paulo, uh, one of the things I noticed is that people found that people in Tijuana, their lives were very similar to those of the lives of people in, in Sao Paulo. And they had thought previously that this, that they were very different because of the media's reporting. Anyway, next slide, please. So these are two examples of use. That's the, how it was in uh, Sao Paulo. Um, but two examples of using um, a body as a way to connect or perceive another body. This um, lays the ground for my work now, the Laboratory for Embodied Intelligences. Next slide, please. Um, and the Laboratory for Embodied Intelligences is a, a shifting network of artists, scientists, and other experts collaborating to produce art and public experiences that allow the public through different means to try on non-human perspectives. We want to learn from other species by employing techniques of embodied thinking, many of them developed through the bodies of dancers. Um, our first focus is learning to walk a mile in microbes' shoes in hopes that we might get a taste of a microbial worldview. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the fabulous organizations that supported this. I'm very grateful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and now let's play this with sound, please. The these are the ideas we're is, What is intelligence? How can we think about non-human intelligence from a non-human perspective? Is there any way we can get outside of our human framework to actually somehow sense, taste, perceive the intelligence of another creature? They're moving like bacteria. I was artist in residence at the SETI Institute. It's a, a very serious organization allied with NASA. I had sort of two key interests, and one was if they're searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, I was very interested to know how are they defining intelligence and who is defining it. I also had done some research and I learned that the most likely form of life all the astrobiologists feel they'll find out in space are microbes. If you know you're going to find microbes and you're looking for intelligence, it would seem really interesting to look for intelligence in microbes here on Earth. What's been amazing that was discovered you know, in the last couple of decades is that they actually do communicate with each other by exchanging chemicals. There are certainly serious researchers who would agree that they may well have a, a rich form of communication and intelligence that we can't yet comprehend. Next slide, please. Um, and so just for one second, though, this has been covered a bit by others, but why microbes? Why, why do we care about them? Um, we very recent now that our tooling has gotten better, as we've gotten smarter, we are able to start to discern actually how clever microbes are. Um, and Dr. Lauren Marino has found that um, that uh, all mobile unicellular organisms um, ha possess the fundamental characteristics of nervous systems. They have some of the same organelles, the same capacities. So it's very possible, or anyway, it's fascinating to consider that uh, single cell organisms like bacteria may possess cognitive capacities and modes of reason um, similar to ours or in some way. 
Uh, we also know that bacteria have survived on this earth for upwards of 3.8 billion years. Um, that sure is way better than our track record. And I, I suspect there's a lot we could learn from creatures that have managed to survive and not destroy the planet. Uh, and also, I, astrobiologists all agree that microbes will be the most likely form of life we'll find outside uh, in space travel. And so if we can study these microbes here, bacteria, we may learn ways to communicate with the extraterrestrials that we are likely to find. And lastly, uh, we have 150 times more bacteria, bacterial DNA in and on our bodies than human DNA. So we may not even be running this show, um, but uh, certainly our, our whole life is complex, very symbiotically and, and fascinatingly intertwined with those of bacteria. So we would, uh, I'm fascinated to see what we can learn by looking into them directly. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a little, yeah, you could just run that video for a moment. Um, we started first by, yeah, oh, all right. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so the bacteria, yeah, so we evolved from these extremophiles. And since um, all of our movement capacities are based on their movement capacities, all the cells in our body have, our, the activities of our cells are based on the capacities of extremophiles. Our movements are based on those capacities. And our logic, as I talked about in the beginning, is based on our movement. It's highly, I suspect that there is some reason that we have a kind of continuous, we see some continuities of behavior across species from the single cellular on through plants, animals, and us. Next slide, please. But Danielle, you can also, I have answered some of your further questions, so you can bounce me forward if, this, if I'm spending too much time in this area. Well, we Feel should free. start to wrap up soon to, because we only have about seven minutes left and we want to make sure we have audience questions and, and, and that if there's any, I think it'd also be great if if everyone like Tiare and, and Delma and everybody can who's left online can uh, can connect. Um, yes. Do so you, you um, go ahead. So, so I should, okay. So if you would like me to wrap up, maybe I'll, I don't know, I could talk about the, research um, the process. Maybe I'll just talk about what I have coming up then. Maybe yeah, just that'd be great. Bounce through the slides. Yeah, if you want to just click okay. through the slides um, and you'll see this is uh, just some of the things uh, that feed into this work. Um, my research process is uh, driven from this kind of curiosity. I have uh, lots of dialogue with people, lots of looking at visual stimuli, trying to take that through my body and working with dancers then to pass on that information so that we can develop choreography based on microbial movement. When the audience sees this choreography, because they they get a much different, a visceral understanding of microbial sociality, communication, um, perception, their modes of perception, which are highly, um, exquisitely sensitive, um, and how um, they're very highly tuned into each other. So this, you can keep bouncing through. Um, this is something we try to draw out with choreography and also in public workshops where we lead people to be able to move and sense with each other in the way microbes do and tune into a sort of, again, um, pre-cultural way of sensing um, in hopes of sort of offsetting some of the toxic politics going on uh, often in our lives. Um, so what I have coming up actually tonight uh, is a performance at the Music Center as part of um, uh, Sleepless, which was curated by uh, Fulcrum Arts and Robert Crouch. Um, and I will, my dancers will be performing back, uh, microbial and bacterial movements um, offset by uh, the fabulous vocalist Carmino Escobar, who will be um, singing phrases of um, uh, descriptions of how bacteria behave, how scientists are speculating about bacterial intelligence. Um, and video by Drew Heitzler. And then I have um, a couple of more performances coming up this year and then planning um, some interactive video installations and so that the public can further bodily engage and a VR or AR experience, which will really allow people to physically interact on, on a human scale with bacteria. Thanks.
Uh, excellent. I mean, really, really amazing work, Nina. And I love um, the understanding, being able to understand really around some of the scientific process in terms of how that got connected into your current work and, and, and moving forward. Um, I do want to open it up for questions. We have a couple more minutes, but I do have a, a special announcement. We've, we've had uh, some, some great visitors on our live stream. And um, because of that, the Ministry of Education and Culture of Uruguay has declared interest of all activities for Leonardo's 50th anniversary celebrations and STEAM projects in Uruguay. So this is a, um, a great official announcement, um, uh, which shows a lot of support from the Latin American region, especially in, um, in Uruguay. Um, so there is... Um, a couple comments here. Oh, let's see. Um, Amy, Amy Carlyle, she doesn't have any questions, but she's just enjoying this. Uh, 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 here's a here's a comment for Nina uh, from um, Piadpa. Wow, brings us all together and, and breath of fresh air around your narratives corroding our creativity. <laughs> That's <Okay>. fun. <laughs> Okay. Um, Maria Cristiana um, Biasus comments um, that Stellark was amazing and enjoyed a lot of, and she considers Stellark uh, would serve on an acknowledgement uh, to be a pioneer in art and technology. Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's not Piadpa. Wow, it's Piadpa Palacios. Excuse me. Um, Piadpa Palacios. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, I also want to open it up. Um, we only have like two more minutes. So if there's any any other comments or questions or Tiare, you want to ask something of Nina. Nina, you want to ask something of Tiare uh, or even um, Delma? I'd love to. Oh, I mean, Tiare, um, I loved your presentation. And I just want to, I could say this offline, but it would be really fun to talk further and um, collaborate. I've been working a lot on having the dancers learn how to glide like cyanobacteria, which is one of the um, great mysteries for science. They don't quite know how they move. Uh, and I think, and we've been looking at other, other things that cyanobacteria are capable of. So uh, it would be really fun to put together your knowledge and, and movement Absolutely. if you're interested. Absolutely. I was really inspired. Um, by your talk and hearing about how you've also integrated uh, movement and performance into kind of reinterpreting and experiencing what it is to be a microbe, what it is to be a bacteria. And um, I would, yeah, I would love to talk further about your research and um, it just am ex extremely inspired. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so, so what I was curious as to like what other, um, bacteria that you have focused on? Is there, um, uh, is it kind of like the ones that exist um, inside us specifically? Um, I, I, there was a lot to cover there. So I just had that one question as to like what, what um, specific bacteria and, and those relationships you were, you were really trying to hone in on in these uh, movement Thanks. experiments. If yeah, well, that's great. And here's one image. Actually, if, if you back up to that previous image and then then you could go forward. You'll find some other black and white images of these uh, bacteria. I've had the great fortune of working with um, Penny Boston, who's the director of NASA's, there you go, Astrobiology Institute. And these are her gorgeous photos of um, bacteria that she's found in, uh, as she, she, she explores caves, because she's been working on life on Mars for since the 70s. And um, uh, most folks believe they're going to find the bacteria on Mars either underground or under in the water. So she's mm -hmm. an underground bacteria specialist. And these are bacteria that she's found that they don't quite know what the heck they're doing, which that's one <laughs> of our favorite areas to work in, um, in the Laboratory for Embodied Intelligences, because this is where... Um, and Penny has said she thinks we could be helpful, too. This is where, by working from the inside out, we can just try to speculate physically as to like, what do these configurations allow? What kind of sociality do they produce? Um, how do you build more complex things out of them, et cetera? Because they, they're, it's very early and they, they don't know. 
So, but we also love uh, E. coli. We're big fans of E. coli, who are very brilliant. They can move <laughs> their sensing organs anywhere they want on their bodies. They can move their appendages wherever they want on their bodies. Totally cool. Yeah, it, I, I, th I thought it was incredible that you pointed out their, their intenses, which I had forgot to mention, but they're extremely intelligent and, and the communication networks that they have between them that people often forget about when they think of bacteria. So I think it's immensely important work and um, yeah, excited to take this offline too and continue talking about it. Um, the, the, I think in exploring the unknown and, and looking at these cave bacteria and the bacteria we don't actually know too much about, I think that's some of the most exciting research and you know um and and for me i'm really interested in like um oceanic microorganisms and bacteria and you know the the deep sea ones that um th there's so many we don't know about you know so so finding those and exploring those some of the deep well, sea I, ones are insane <laughs> yeah Is it no, time to stop? sorry <laughs> sorry it is, it is time to wrap up i hate that wrap up part because i could go on forever <laughs> Um, but uh, thank you both very much. And I want to invite you all, of course, to come to our um, flagship event in San Francisco, November 3rd through 4th. Uh, you can find more about Leonardo Info 50th anniversary. I do want to put a special thanks out there to our translators. I'm going to read their names off right now. Uh, translating in Portuguese is Maria Jose Riero, uh, Catalina Capelletti y Matias um, Hernandez y Matias Gonzalez. And in English, we have Gonzalo um, Peralta, Emilia Perez, Analia, and Britos Rodrigo Machado Romina Diaz. And then the team, I'd like to thank um, uh, Martha Avila, Eduardo Romero, Julio Cardoza, uh, Federico Brum. Alejandra Fabiero y Fernando González, and of course, Delma Rodriguez, the director for Ania, Ania Cultural, and for all of the artists who joined us today and everyone um, jo uh, who was here live, uh, um, please join us again in person or live. Remember, we are going to be in Uruguay also in November uh, 19th through 23rd. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Delma or any of the artists. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. All invited. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am Hi. Hi. <laughs> See you soon. OK, nice to meet you all. Thanks so much. <laughs> It's an honor to be here. Have an amazing day and night. Bye-bye. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Daniele. That was great. <laughs> and thank you to all of team. Your call will be disconnected. Se desconectará la llamada.